Is there a more perfect situation than Chicago making it to the Super Bowl? No, Justin I mean, Fields outduels Tom Brady yeah. in the in the championship game. I mean, the the city of Chicago, like you know, the poor Bears fans deserve it. I think Bear, that'd be one of the coolest ways. Plus, plus you know what I love about Justin Fields is he was he was like angry. Yeah. Like you watched him on draft night, he was angry. Now I I think he's a little bit of that anyway. I think he's a serious minded kid and and a, a little like Joe Burrow. I mean, it's one of the things I liked about Joe Burrow. I've seen some of these young quarterbacks come in and they go, all right, how many commercials am I going to get? How many, you know, hey, am I name Baker Mayfield. <laughs> yeah, I mean, all, all of them, right? I mean, they're all going to do some of that to some extent. Joe Burrow from the first day he came to Cincinnati was like locked and loaded. Yeah. Now, you know, he got hurt, yeah. whatever. But I think Justin Fields is going to be taken seriously from day one by his teammates up there. All right, welcome into the Chris Collinsworth podcast featuring Richard Sherman. Uh, we're working hard to get Richard Sherman his very own podcast here on PFF. So hopefully we'll do that here soon. And it's presented by our friends at DraftKings and DraftKings Sportsbook and the Sportsbook app. We're going to talk about DraftKings and some of their betting lines today because uh, we're going to talk about the National Football League, all the changes, the draft picks, the free agency, but we're going to do it in light of some gambling odds. Um, I brought in George Shahuri and Eric Eager, who co-host the PFF Forecast podcast, which is all about betting 24-7. They are our resident mathematicians, and they're going all in on gambling. They're fresh back from Vegas, so we'll get a few tales of what they were doing there. But I think you're going to really enjoy this because we get really in-depth into some of these football teams and the moves they made this off season and uh, maybe a better two that you might like on certain teams as you move forward. So here we go with Eric Eager and George Shaher. All right, here we go with the Chris Collinsworth podcast and uh, we're going to do something a little different today. I have never done this. I'm kind of pumped about this. we got Eric Eager here. we got George Shaher over here on the other side and, um, they're in charge of all things gambling. They just got back from Vegas. These are my degenerates. They, uh, they, they. Nobody knows how to have a good time better. And how many, how many kickouts? How many just different <laughs> new mattresses? How many different hotel rooms did PFF actually have to pay for when you guys were in Vegas? I legally can't tell you because what happened there stays there. So. I, that's a good point. That's the only thing that we point. come back with Especially is Especially my tickets. money when it came yeah. to betting FCS <laughs> games. My money stayed there. Okay, so tell. <laughs> so this is a good story to open it up because it's not. there's nothing lewd about this story. But this guy, this is how committed he is. Committed. Okay, we're out till, you know, 4 or 5 a.m. every day. This is our married father. Of two. Former uh, college math professor, yeah. correct? Yep, yep. Yes. The oldest guy on the trip by four years probably, yep. right? I mean, He sets an alarm for 8 a.m. on Saturday morning to go bet Sam Houston State versus who was the other team even? Uh, South Delaware. Delaware. Delaware, okay? yeah. And we are in a cabana at the nicest pool club in Vegas. At 7 a.m. Well, no, later that day. Yeah, so, he, so the game started at noon Eastern, but it was 9 Pacific. So, like, if I if I just let myself wake up, I would have missed betting the game. So, like, missed it. And I knew, like, this is part of – we'll talk about this. The, the spread for the game was 9.5, 8.5, 8, 7.5. I knew by morning it would be 7, and I didn't want to lay 7.5. I wanted to lay 7. So I was like, okay, when I wake up, South Dakota State's going to be minus 7. It's going to be a smash. So I went downstairs, and I bet it. And then I'm I'm watching it I'm because it's an FCS game so I'm like watching it on a stream or something and it's on the way on the way to the pool club yeah okay, we get there there is a television in the cabana it's it's 90 degrees and sunny outside this guy is in the cabana <laughs> screaming at the jackrabbits I mean <laughs> screaming at the jackrabbits until the game is over. well I bet two games that day and both teams I bet on were up 24 three at one point and I split the bet so the jackrabbits won. And then James Madison uh, blew a 24-3 lead, which caused me maybe to drink an extra margarita or two. Uh, uh, I, I think at this point I want out. I want no <laughs> – I want plausible deniability about anything that happened in Vegas. So, all right, we're going to do a kind of a hybrid show here because obviously uh, sports betting is – 
going to be a huge part of everything sports related from here on out. I mean, it, it, if, if it had a stigma, if we're uncomfortable with it, if you don't want to talk about it, you got to get over it because it's over, right? Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court rule, this is all legal. This is going to be like it is in Europe now. This is going to be, you can bet on presidential elections. You can do whatever. It's just going to take a little bit of time, state by state. It is just going to ramp up to the point where it's everywhere, right? It's everywhere. So we're going to do a little hybrid show, get you up to date, post-draft what's happening with some of these football teams. And we'll also talk about maybe the potential MVP race, mm -hmm. rookies of the year, um, over-unders on win totals. And you guys can explain it to me because I figure if I don't know about this, there's a whole bunch of football fans out there that don't know about this either. And so we'll just kind of start off. Okay, is that fair? Let's do it. Okay. Let, let's start with the Kansas City Chiefs. Okay. So the Kansas City Chiefs um, come in second place by no matter how you want to analyze yes, that. It was they got blown out in, in the Super Bowl. And they got blown out basically because, A, they couldn't score any points because their offensive line was decimated at that point. Um, and, 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 B, they just ran into, you know, a, a hot team. They ran into Tampa, who was just playing great with, with Tom Brady. So as you look at the over-under uh, win total for the Kansas City Chiefs, it is 12 and a half. Now, remember, 17 games this year, yep. so that number is skewed a little bit. Mm -hmm. and, and Eric, tell me how that is impacting what you guys are thinking now. It's actually really interesting because not only does every team get a 17th game, but it's not uniform. The AFC teams all get a home game. The NFC teams all get a road game. And, and then there's the question of now that we have fans back in the stands, does home field advantage matter, right? So, so some, for some teams, it's like an extra half a win on their win total from a 16 game for other teams. It's, you know, it, it's not quite as much because you're going to, you're going to in green Bay's case, they're going to Kansas city for their 17th game. So do we really think they have a 50% chance to win that? And, and well, so not it, with Jordan love, they don't. no, not with Jordan love. <laughs> and, and it, and it's sort of, again, and, and I think the markets are trying to figure this out. We actually computed on in betting markets historically they've given out more win totals than the 256 that were available or yeah. whatever 200 wh however many and now it's two, it's 272 and actually these are these markets are doing a pretty good job of sort of balancing overs and unders because what do fans like to do we talked about this off air fans love to bet overs on their favorite team this is the the time of great opportunity for everybody and so if you're a better generally speaking this time of the year is a good time to go under but these have actually done a pretty good job because I don't know if the market's really sure how to handle that 17th game. And I, I would add to that. So, you know, the, you hit on a great point, which is we always, our inclination is to be optimistic. You know, when you see a good team or a good player, like props are a good example. Is this guy, is this receiver who I love, Mike Evans, going to get over 65 and a half receiving yards? Of course he is. Because all I remember is him going over that total. But that's the natural inclination and the math says oftentimes you want to bet against that. So if you look at the adjusted totals, and what I mean by that is if you look at Kansas City, for you to bet over 12 and a half, it, it's plus 123, yeah. I believe, which means if I want to bet $100 and they go over 12 and a half wins, I win 123. Okay, right? so that's, that's the difference. So let's just keep yeah. this simple okay. for me too. Plus 123. So everything starts with you're going to bet 100 bucks. Yep. Plus 123 would mean that you got that. If it's minus 110, it takes a $110 bet to win 100. Exactly. Okay. And that's and that's essentially the the market's hold. So, you know, the the casino has to have a reason to bet with you, and the reason is that you are you're laying more money than you're going to win if the bet is 50-50, and conversely that means they're getting more for every time somebody bets with them. As long as their numbers are such that 50% land on either side, then they're doing well because they're getting 10 cents every time you know a, a dollar is being bet when when you look at some of these things when it's when it's something like as discrete as win totals they there's not like it's not like a total in football where you can just go from 48 to 49 like there's only 17 wins that can be given out so oftentimes what you'll see here with Kansas City is they'll lay what's called the index at 12 and a half 
but then the price is different on overs and unders because there's still some like sort of bias towards an under. So here, for example, if you were negative on the Chiefs and you wanted to bet under 12 and a half, you'd have to lay a dollar fifty to win every dollar, one hundred fifty dollars for every hundred dollars. And that's again because even though the number's 12 and a half, there really isn't a number for which you know the the market thinks that there's a 50 50 chance they go over and under. So they go to the nearest number and then change the price. Interesting. Way too much for me. All right, so let's talk about the Chiefs just traditionally for a second now. Um, the, the big story here with this football team is basically they've remade their entire offensive line, right? I mean, there's just no way of looking at this uh, any differently. They, they've got Orlando Brown that they've signed that came over, with basically a trade came over from the Ravens. Uh, Joe Tooney from the Patriots. Uh, Kyle Long comes out of retirement, mm -hmm. potentially can help. Austin Blythe comes over uh, from the Rams. They draft a center in Creed Humphrey, who was um, two-time offensive lineman of the yep. year in, in the Big 12. Uh, they draft Nick Bolton, so they're, uh, they have some depth at the, at the linebacker position now. But the main story is going to be they fixed this offensive line, and short of Aaron Rodgers going to the Denver Broncos, you got to feel pretty good about where the Kansas City Chiefs sit. And they're the favorites, right? I mean, if you had to say who's the favorite in the NFL this year, it's the Kansas City Chiefs. Yeah. And they, I mean, they've, they've, they're somehow a team that's been the favorite to win the Super Bowl for two straight seasons. Actually, I think three straight three seasons. Straight, yeah. And yet in this offseason, they were able to draft, use the draft to get, I think, four starters. They were able to get Jerron Reed from the Seattle Seahawks, who's a good pass rusher, compliments Chris Jones. Frank Clark has kind of come up. A little, uh, you know, bad for them in that trade. So they get some, they get some help there. Um, you know, they they've made a couple sneaky moves. They they traded for Mike Hughes. They got DeAndre Baker, two former first round picks at corner who have busted. Mm -hmm. But you know, that's their sort of their mo to sort of go in on those. But you look at that. You you have a heart, starter in Humphrey. You have a starter in Bolton, and Noah Gray is a tight end. They've never been able to compliment Kelsey at that position. And the one place, I mean, you remember opening day against Houston, they tried to jam Clyde Edwards-Alaire into the end zone seven times near the end zone. He couldn't, he couldn't make any of them. They've been a team that's been elite offensively, especially between the 20s. But in the red zone, they've only been kind of average over the past few years. It's interesting. And that's what they're trying to do. That's how Tampa got them late in that game when they played in the regular season. That's what I saw. When I watched it, of course, Tyreek Hill went crazy yeah. in the first quarter and had like 800 yards of offense. But when they switched to the zones, especially in the red zone, and they discovered something and it carried right through. They're, they're a team that's, that builds their, – their best players get separation, right? Like Travis Kelsey is not a big – Big guy fade, box a guy out. He's a separator. Tyree kills a separator. Cornell Powell out of Clemson, Noah Gray out of Duke, I think are guys who can who can body players in the red zone. And Mahomes is the accuracy, I think, to make so, it. So that was a very I'm I'm shocked that the resident chief over here went went positive. I'm gonna skew a little negative here. And interestingly, our simulations have Tampa Bay winning the Super Bowl more often than Kansas City does, in large part because it's gonna be easier for them to make it there. Um, you know, the, the NFC not being quite as strong. But I, I'll say this, the red zone issues, I, I feel as though they made some moves on the offensive line that were compensating for one game where both their tackles were hurt and ignore a couple of other issues which are maybe in the, ends, in the red zone, they need a third option. Maybe they need more than Hill and Kelsey, just like a lot of teams need a third, fourth option like Tampa Bay had. And I do think they've opened themselves up to being a little fragile there. Sammy Watkins gone now. He's yeah, playing for they, Baltimore. They, they acknowledge that in free. I agree with you. I mean, they they were in on Juju Smith-Schuster. He just chose Pittsburgh. They were in on Josh Reynolds. He just chose Tennessee. I think they just swung and missed at the at that spot as opposed to not as opposed to avoiding it. If I'm if I'm looking at Kansas City and I wonder, okay, what's the leak this year? Last year was offensive line depth, a very fragile position where it's about as good as your weakest link they don't i, I talk about mike Hughes. like if, if your options at corner behind your starters are mike hughes and deandre baker like you're you're betting on some pretty long shots there so to me i wonder if they have injuries in the secondary this year similar to what they had in the offensive line are we coming back this time next year and saying well look kansas city spent all their money rebuilding the second you know, are they always playing whack-a-mole with the with the most apparent problem yeah but that legerious need had a big year for yep. them last year great. too and it, are they re-signing breland 
Uh, Breland's still a free agent, it looks like. So and but but Travarius Ward's a good player. They they're a rare team that's gotten good. Like so, last season in this going into the Super Bowl, the teams that generated the most war per dollar at the corner position were Tampa and Kansas City. Tampa, both teams, very good at taking cheap options and making uh, them into good players. I'll position. just say this last thing about the offensive line thing. I think it's fascinating because I think Mahomes, he's the big favorite to be MVP. Yep. Overwhelming. He's five to one right now. In two second. Rodgers. Uh, is it Brady? I don't think it's Rodgers. Uh, yes. Um, well, you look that up. What I was going to say is this. In 2018, Rodgers. he throws, what is it, 52 t- 53 touchdowns, whatever it is. And he had a higher rate of pressure. He was under pressure 36% of the time. And he got rid of the ball quicker, 2.8 seconds, than he did last year. Lower pressure rate, longer time to throw. It's not just about protection. It's about guys being open and him having the ability to make those throws and his toe. I mean, yeah. you got you can't you can't watch the Super Bowl and oh, not sure. go. You know, this guy was hurt. Yeah, but you look at the main difference between the Super Bowl in nineteen and the Super Bowl in twenty was Sammy Watkins against the 49ers at six catches for like ninety five. Yeah, I would argue the difference was Jimmy G and Tom Brady. <laughs> sure, but, but Jimmy G played a good game in that game. I felt yeah. like he would have been the MVP of the game had the Chiefs not come back. He also didn't get the uh, pass interference call that Gronk yeah. and Brady got. That's true. Let, but- let, let, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna divert away just for a second. Jimmy G. I think what the 49ers potentially are doing here may be brilliant. <laughs> like if Jimmy G comes back and plays quarterback this year, right? And and they win. 12 games, go to the playoffs, get beaten the AFC championship game, which is kind of where you would pencil them in, you know, or I would. I I, I think that, but for the injuries a year ago, they would have been right back in in that position, assuming they they stay healthy. If, If you make the decision to let Garoppolo play this year, just let him play. He's good, and he gets your team into the playoffs. The most valuable thing you have on your roster now is Jimmy Garoppolo and your ability to trade him, Yeah, right? Because Trey Lance is now going to have a year to get ready. And instead of him being on the scrap heap and you try and get rid of him for some low price thing, you let him play for a year, you let Lance develop for a year, and now you have probably potentially at least a second round, if not a first round, if he plays great this year. Well, I think that that's what the market believes if we we – printed the uh, market implied sort of power rankings the market believes the rams and the niners are basically tied to be the fifth best team in the nfl which on its face seems interesting right because the rams the Ram- well the rams have stafford now they have Ooh. McVay and all like i i think they're a little overrated i also think the, the here's the thing about jimmy g jimmy g's never failed the 49ers on the field it's almost always been injuries right like he has always played well enough to win for them not great not elite but like, if that's what the Niners feel, if they, if they like as you said, can shoot the moon and, and get a full season out of him, and he plays extremely well, he averages eight point five yards per attempt, like he almost always does. Then you can flip him, a la how the Detroit Lions flip Matthew Stafford, who I don't think has had all that much better from an efficiency standpoint. He might be a better player, but efficiency standpoint, how much better than Jimmy G has he really been? Yeah, I, do you see that as a because is. Is getting a first round pick for Jimmy G worth keeping Trey Lance on the bench? I mean, Trey Lance has how few snaps does oh, this sure. guy have? But they took him third overall. Third, I mean, o- third overall. Faith. But you do not want. And everything I've been told is he's this really smart guy. He's going to pick it up. I'm, I'm sure Kyle Shanahan's going to give him some. You fake this handoff and you throw that backside slant. He's going to make it as simple as he possibly can. And oh, by the way, he's going to be able to make plays with his feet. Mm-hmm. I, I understand that. And and in my opinion is I would not play Trey Lance until next year. I would play Justin Fields in, in Chicago. I, I think that Justin Fields is going to learn more because he only got to play, what, six games or mm-hmm. whatever it was, a uh, season eight, I guess, with the playoffs and everything. Um, I, I, I just look at, he's a guy I think I would throw in there right away. And for whatever reason, I would want to maximize the value for Garoppolo. I, I think I, so I agree in the sense that I, I think that Lance, 
I, I don't think the Niners should have taken Lance over Fields. I think that Fields is so much better of a prospect, and I think he has a high. I think his ceiling might not be quite as high, but he can reach the ceiling far quicker. Uh, that's the, uh, that's my belief too. So. The the harder part though is the flip side of Lance not having played last season was that if you sit him for another year, you're talking about a guy who will have sat two years pro basically without playing before you put him on an NFL field and then you eat up. So the, the hard part about the trade up is that you're giving up first round picks, right? And and then you, the, the benefit of a quarterback at three is 100% the fact that they don't make any money. And so having Garoppolo and Lance on the same team for a year where you don't eat into Lance's value is sort of wasting one year of cost control. That that's my only concern there because I do think I do think that having him sit is probably the smart. He's the least ready to start right now. Okay, like, I but, think of all but, the quarterbacks. Yeah, but hold on for a second. Are you saying that if he is the better quarterback at some point in the season? That you're going to keep him on the bench? I actually don't think so. But like, but my, I, I believe the Chiefs should have started Mahomes in like week well, twelve of that. So year, I was going to use know, like, that as an example. Everyone is using the Mahomes Chiefs example as this is the right way to do it. And I would argue, but you just don't know the other side of it. The Chiefs may have won the Super Bowl. The Patriots thought Mahomes was going to start Week One that season. That was a really weird year where the Jaguars were in the AFC title <laughs> yeah. game, the Eagles with Nick Foles were in the Super Bowl, the Vikings with Case Keenum. Like, that was a winnable Super Bowl that I sometimes believe that Andy Reid just sort of left on the table by one. And, and look, Alex Smith was considered like a great teammate and all that. I get the personal aspect of it, but in some ways, wouldn't you rather them be kind of ruthless like the Niners were with Kaepernick in 2012 and just say, like, look, Alex, you did a great job for me, but it's time to step aside. We want to win a Super Bowl uh, here. But believe me, Kyle Shanahan, if he gets to that point, he, you don't have to worry about the Shanahans yeah. being ruthless enough. I mean, it, they're yeah, there. Mike, Mike did it with Cutler, too, right? Like, he yeah. had Jake Plummer, and then, like, I think it was Thanksgiving, Plummer's rookie, and they were in the playoff hunt, and they're like, it's time to put the rookie in. Like, I, I think they'll do it, but... I, I mean, I also set up the question to where he could play a whole year, where, remember, the trade deadline is now, what, the end of mm -hmm. October or sure. something yeah. like that? So, I mean, if, if you can get enough out of Jimmy G and, and let Trey Lance figure it out for a little while uh, and then trade him after they're seven and one, you know, now you've got something... Well, that's that what I think they're going to do because yeah. right now they can't trade Jimmy G. He does not have that kind of value. If he comes out and plays well, my point exactly. he'll have value. Well, yeah. But I would say that I would be, if Trey Lance is the better quarterback at some, at some point in the season, you have to play him. And if he's never the better quarterback at some point in the season, I would be concerned. Yeah. But yeah, he's, he's, he's got to be. <laughs> you and, know? And, I, I mean, it is, it is just such an interesting question for this team. It's, it's almost like I, I've been in huddles with rookie quarterbacks. They can't even call the play. Yeah. I mean, you're sitting there going, oh, God, are we really, you know, and it's mm -hmm. like you're, you're breaking the huddle without real confidence. Mm -hmm. And and the Shanahan calls are going to be complex. The running game in San Francisco is as complex right. as the passing game is and maybe more complex. Um, so I just think that I, I think at the very least you want Garoppolo having a chance to in some way enhance his value you know, we always talk about that during draft season, but I think this is one of those times in season you have to give him that chance. It's not like you're doing that in Chicago, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not building Andy Dalton's yeah. value up the way that you could Garoppolo. Well, and, and is there a chance? We saw it in Philadelphia with Wentz and Bradford. Is there, like, I think there's a ton of value in hanging on to him just for the simple fact that every so often there's, you know, when Tannehill tore his ACL and Cutler had to come back yeah. or, you know, Bridgewater tears his knee up and they have to trade. Like, you even have a situation where if a team gets super desperate, Jimmy oh. G might be a plug-and-play guy for them. Absolutely. So, like, you, if you if you have an injury in preseason, which we're having preseason now, which is different than last year too like to me it's just you have an opportunity to showcase lance you have an opportunity for other teams to have injuries frankly and so you have a guy who a team might say hey look like we're we're deciding between trading for cam newton for the patriots or jimmy grappolo do you want to throw us a late one all right yeah. let, let, let me move on because you guys said something that that startled me a little bit the rams are now the fifth choice Along with the 49ers. Yeah. So the Rams, the Rams and the 49ers are currently co-favorites to be the NFC West champion. They're both um plus 180. The Seahawks, the defending champion, are three to one to win their own division. 
Pittsburgh is another team that's like that, a defending champion that's more than three to one to win their current both, division. Both the Rams and the Niners have the same win total, 10 and a half. The price on either side is a little different, um, but basically Vegas thinks they're right there neck and neck. And interestingly, and I, I want to ask you this, one of the reasons is that they feel the defenses are both very good, the two best defenses in the NFL. How, when you hear that, what come, what are you thinking about? Well, the Rams lost their defensive coordinator too, and but more than that, both they, did right. They, they they've lost, and when I looked at the Rams, I mean, their safety John Johnson was their play caller. Green dot. He yep. was he was their play caller. Uh, Troy Hill is a heck of a player, um, and uh, both of them went to Cleveland. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They both go to good Lord. Cleveland might win the whole friggin' thing this year, and then they on their defensive line, Brockers, Morgan Fox. Uh, Abukum um, are, are all key depth parts to to that defensive line. Uh, off the offense now, Blythe and Everett and Josh Reynolds all had significant roles. And this team added two players. They added Stafford in the mm -hmm. trade, obviously, uh, and they added Deshaun Jackson, who, when he's right, is yep. a game changer. But if he's not right and he can't make it through the season, he that means be Tutu field. Atwell yeah. is now going to yeah. take that And they that drafted spot. with their top pick a guy who's basically redundant with Jackson. So it's sort of weird that they use two assets to acquire the same thing. Yeah, right now the Rams are tied for third highest odds to win the Super Bowl with Buffalo. So it's Kansas City, Tampa Bay, and then Buffalo, L.A., and then a little bit behind them are the Ravens and the Packers. So the team and, – and then the Browns. The teams are really – like the, the markets really like the Rams, and this number has only gone gotten better or worse if you're a better since the Stafford trades. So I, I, I'm a little worried. So like you talk about like their defense regressing because they lose players. I also think like Leonard Floyd last year had a, was involved in 13 sacks and like half of them were cleanups or unblocked. The other half were after four seconds against Russell Wilson, frankly. And so then, so do you get the same production out of him? Do you get the same health out of Donald? Do you get Jalen Ramsey, who we know defensive back play is oscill oscillatory? Does Ramsey, is he as brilliant next year as the previous? Probably without, not Darius Williams. Yeah. Darius Williams as well. Like, I think there's a lot here that screams regression. And we're looking at that division, and the best quarterback by a country mile is the three to one third favorite to win that division to, to me it seems off i i just look at this team as a salary cap dump year i mean they got killed because when it got it actually was shrunk that meant all those intermediate players yeah. had to go right that i always say it, it's always great to, to sign a jalen ramsey it's always great uh to sign aaron donald and, and those big contracts are great and they're sexy and all that but man, you get to the end. We're playing 17 games now. Mm -hmm. That means a whole bunch of guys are going to have to be on the field because you're going to have injuries. You're going to have issues. They've already lost their leadership in the back end of this defense. Yeah. They've lost their defensive coach. For me to anticipate that this defense is going to be what it was a season ago, I can't go there. I mean, I, Matthew Stafford may be an upgrade over Goff, and maybe that's true. Maybe Jackson comes back and has an unbelievable year. But when you said they were like tied for fifth, and I, that one surprised me. What? So let me ask you this then. Okay, so you got Tampa Bay, NFC, Tampa Bay, and then Green Bay, huge question mark. Yeah. Because of Rodgers. So assume Rodgers comes back. He, they're the second best team. If they, he doesn't come back, they're nowhere near it. Who's that next team in the NFC? I think the Browns or the Bills. Well, the Browns are in the AFC. I'm, we, I'm sorry. Yeah. I thought you were just talking about yeah, that. No, no. In the I NFC, thought you were saying it was the top five in the league. Right. But I'm curious. Like, the NFC, it's the Bucks, the Packers if they have Rodgers. But then, like, you just talked about the Rams and being not bullish on them. Who Who is the next best team well, in the Because you look at the AFC last year, and it was one team above them. And I think Tampa is that team in the NFC. I think Tampa – is going to just kind of cruise this year because you look and there's no and the thing about Tampa is interesting too. So would you bet them to make the Super Bowl? What are their odds there? Uh, I mean, you almost I, the the thing about them too that's also interesting is that they play a second place schedule, which matters incrementally more in a year where your 17th game also depends upon like yeah. winners. So Tampa's uh, plus 325 to win the nfc i have to look at the numbers i i mean we that have does a 28 percent chance to make the super bowl yeah um you know it's it sort of seems 
it kind of seems sexy here. The only issue is we never know when Brady's going to fall off. Like that's like the only question. But he don't yeah. showed unlike I Manning, bet on it. unlike Manning <laughs> in twenty fourteen, Brady showed no signs of, of falling off last year. No, right? He got like stronger when, once he, he real, stronger. once he learned Spanish and could call the plays. <laughs> he had no problem with it, you yeah. know. Yeah, I mean, I I but like that. The, I mean, that conference. I, I feel like Chris, you're going to be in Tampa like every other week because by me, I can yeah. just drive right up the road. The, the, let, uh, I, go ahead. Let, let, let's talk about a couple other teams then. Okay, I think it's a fair point in the NFC. The Arizona Cardinals made a bunch of splash moves mm -hmm. in the right. offseason, right? JJ, AJ Green, Rodney Hudson. Uh, Malcolm Butler, James Conner. I mean, th these are free agents we've heard of, you know, that, that people are going to know their names. Uh, they go eight and eight a season ago. Mm -hmm. Big pressure, I think, on everybody in Arizona yep. to win now, right? But I, I will say this about the Cardinals because the Cardinals are one of these teams that to me has this massive range of outcomes. And it has nothing to do, I actually don't think it has anything really to do with J.J. Watt. J.J. Watt needs to stay healthy, but you can't predict that. Um, you can't count on it. A.J. Green was not good in, in Cincinnati last year. I wouldn't expect him to be a huge difference maker. To me, this is all about Kyler Murray throwing the football. We know what he can do with his legs, but when he got injured late in the season, it went away. And if you look at you know where quarterbacks win consistently, the great quarterbacks own that 10 to 19 area of the field. And that's where Kyler Murray really struggled. Just a 72 pass It's like the Miguel Sano of quarterbacks. Like, Jesus. like 10 home runs, no doubles, bunch of bloops. I, I don't even <laughs> pretend to know who I Miguel Sano know. is. But, like, but that to me is yeah. the big thing. Will, will Cliff Kingsbury's scheme move DeAndre Hopkins around? Will Cliff Kingsbury's scheme allow Kyler to become more efficient as a passer? If yes, then they could beat anybody. And if no... I think they have a hard time being better than 500. Yeah, Cliff is Cliff to me is the biggest one here. And Cliff does a good job every single season early on of being sharper than the opponent. Like if you look when he took over that offense in 2018 was like half a yard worse than every other offense. He got them to like 21st. That was a good leap uh, uh taking that talent. And then last year early on, I thought he would did great. Like midway through the season, you're saying, okay, this this team can actually win. And he got basic, he let the rest of the league run circles around him in the last bunch of games. To me, he not only has to come out of this, if they're gonna go over eight wins, let's say. And that's their win total, by he, the way. Minus 134 eight. to the over. If you if you like that, you have to hope that he comes out of the gate gangbusters mm -hmm. as far as and then he's able to maintain it because the maintenance has been the issue they have the last two seasons under him have petered out at the end as far as a schematic as far as all that kind of thing and, and you wonder if he's got it in him because because the because then the questions arise of okay you have mayfield you had mahomes you had all these great players in college and couldn't have a winning record and then you come to the nfl and you know, you know, I, I wonder if how much he is like Baker Mayfield when when, hmm. you know, both Oklahoma and Baker, the year he had terrible protection in Cleveland was terrible hmm. on either side of that. His protection was pretty good. Last year was much better and it improved uh, last year. I know the sack total went way down um, for the Arizona Cardinals, mm -hmm. at least it, it did. Uh, for Kyler Murray, and, and you just wonder, it was I got it written down here, 27 times in 20 sacked and 48 sacks in 2019. So can he begin to build on that? Um, you know, but you're taking off potentially Larry Fitzgerald, mm -hmm. Patrick Peterson, Kenyon Drake, some of the cornerstones of that franchise yeah. here for a little while. Uh, can you just plug and play the next guys in there and expect the AJ Greens of the world to come get it done? I mean, there's a hope, because I think Malcolm Butler's a better player than Patrick Peterson now. Like, I think Peterson sort of declined substantially. That To me, that's an okay move. I think Jordan Hicks was a much better player in Philadelphia than he was in Arizona. So getting uh, they, you know, getting the linebackers they've had the last two drafts is a good, is a good move. They get... Chandler Jones back, who I think is one of the most underrated pass rushers in all of football. And on the offensive line, I think that's been where they've improved the most as far as they couldn't block a soul in 2018. And now, as to Chris's point, like they've done a good job of protecting Murray. 
does Rondale Moore come in and be a better version of that in, inside receiver than Larry yeah. Fitzgerald was? That's a, to me, that's a big question. If he can get separation early in routes, you know, that's huge. I mean, if you look at – I'm looking at the quarterback annual right now, and you look at Kyler Murray, like, where he's accurate. It's outside the numbers, on the numbers and outside. Thrown over the middle of the field where you should be getting those free throws. And I think that's Ski and Murray. Like, it's just not there. So – I don't know. I, what is? Do you think Cliff Kingsbury will continue to innovate, or have we seen the bullets that he's got? Like, does he does he have another move there? You know, two years. It's it's like the the third time you go around the the batting order, right? You know, by the third time, usually those hitters are starting to figure it out yeah. a little bit, and now they're looking to the bullpen. Yeah. Um, so I, I I don't know. I do like Rondell Moore though. If he co goes back to um, that's the kid from Purdue, right? Yep, yep. That, that had the humongous freshman year. Yep, and I, was I injured mean, most of the last two years. Oh my gosh, he was was he a beast? If he would have been drafted after his freshman year, he might have been a top fifteen pick. Might have been a top five pick. Yeah. I mean, it was. I mean, and he's got you know a really small guy. He was just so talented. That uh, this Saban Collins, the linebacker, you know, you hope that he's ready to play. He certainly looks the part, 6'5, 270. Isaiah Simmons was not great last year. No. You know, now those two guys are going to be plugged in there and they're great the veteran, athletes. You lose the veteran presence in the middle of the defense. The, the Cardinals, I'll say this. So they're six to one to win the division. Yeah. The break even there, you need to win that bet 14.3% of the time to break even. Our simulation has them winning it. 16.9 percent i i think in that I division kinda, i, I kind of like it i, I like him as a long here, shot here's here's another thing that's that i think is a feather in their cap a little bit so we talk about cliff being able to adjust we, chris brings up a good point about after you've seen a guy enough right like that yeah. was one thing like chip kelly had to do in philadelphia and you know andy reed had to do in, like all these guys have to sort of and even sean McVay, year three sean McVay was weaker he was a lot better last season for la both of the defensive coordinators for the Rams and the Niners are gone. So this will be the first time that the defensive coordinators for either of those teams see Cliff. So he might have a little bit of an advantage early on. All right, let's let's go to the Chicago Bears now. Yes. Chicago Bears made the playoffs. They I mean, did. I, I, you know, and you forget that he is now, Nagy has now made the playoffs, what, two out of three years? Mm -hmm. He's eight games over 500 the last three years. As a head Come on. You know, and, and, and you feel like he's on the brink of losing his right. job, right? He's uh, he's he's right there. He's he's getting it done, and now of course, here comes Justin Fields, and I've never heard Chicago fans in general are depressing human beings anyway because they've they've been through with the Cubs. They've yep. they've never had the quarterback. You know all, all the stuff that that you hear about coming out of out of Chicago. Um, but this is a team that, and this is one when you're talking about regressing back and doing all that. The, the one thing that, you know, this defense had been so good, top five points allowed the last in 18, 19, fell off to 14th a season ago. Um, so you go, all right, you're going to have the transition at some point between Andy Dalton and Justin Fields. When's that going to happen? Better be week one, by the way. <laughs> uh, but that's not what they're saying up there yeah, right now. But, that's not uh, what they're saying. I, I mean – Let's just say it here. The game is on NBC. You will be calling it. If yep. Andy Dalton is playing, the mood in that room and that production truck is not super hyped up. If it's Justin Fields, I mean, Fred Gundelli's bouncing off the wall with yeah. excitement. There, right? there are some yeah. really interesting storylines with the, with the Bears. I think Nagy has done a much better job than people give him credit for. Um, Trubisky, I mean, Trubisky as a starter in the NFL – like the last few years, Trubisky as a starter in the NFL, even counting the John Fox years, is 29 and 21. I mean, that's a remarkable. Despite having a PFF grade that is 20 and having a yards per attempt that never was over seven and a half. And I thought the only thing, the only thing that I'll ding Nagy for is I thought he was extremely stale when Nick Foles is in. Like when you like they had Monday night games against the Rams, against the Vikings, it was an awful offense to watch. But for the most part, I think he does a good job of getting players in space. I think Tariq Cohen is a player that they missed at times last year. Uh, I think, you know, Patterson left, but I think Cordero Patterson was a guy. He did a good job of getting him into space as well. Allen Robinson's finally going to have a pass on the right shoulder for once. Like, to me, I like this, and I like it because 
just relative to the betting number. I mean, people seem to be giving Minnesota the majority of the love that they were giving Green Bay when the markets open. And when I think about Chicago, Chicago gets Minnesota two of the last four weeks. Who's starting those games? It's Fields and right. probably a seasoned Fields, right? Like I think that the not That's only does the schedule point. stack up well for Chicago relative to Minnesota and and eventually Green Bay when they start mm-hmm. Jordan Love. I, I think though I think the whole season for them to repeat like we're, we're the market is viewing this team as if they're like a five win team that just acquired a top ten quarterback. No, they're an eight and eight win team. They're an eight win team. They just got a quarterback that, in my opinion, was the second or third best prospect in the whole draft. Yeah, you get it, what uh, seven and a half is the is the over under. Yeah, it was seven, and people have bet it up a little bit. But I think even if you look at sort of the the market to win that division, um, you look at that one. Yeah, so it's Minnesota Green Bay still minus one seventy seven to win the North. Minnesota three to one, Chicago four and a half to one. Now you could have gotten them at six to one. Yeah, but say. then it dipped all the way to three, and it dipped to seven to two, like three but plus three fifty, and it's come back up. So you might still get have an opportunity to get a pretty good number on Chicago here. Let me let me ask you this. I was thinking about like storybook endings to the season because it's like the biggest season ever, right? Is there a more perfect situation than Chicago making it to the Super Bowl? No, Justin I mean, Fields outduels Tom Brady yeah. in the in the championship game. I mean, the the city of Chicago, like you know, the poor Bears fans deserve it. I think Bear- that'd be one of the coolest ways. Plus, plus you season. know what I love about Justin Fields is. He was he was like angry. Yeah. Like you watched him on draft night. He was angry. Now I, I think he's a little bit of that anyway. I think he's a serious minded kid and, and a, a little like Joe Burrow. I mean, it's mm-hmm. one of the things I liked about Joe Burrow. I've seen some of these young quarterbacks come in and they go, All right, how many commercials am I gonna get? And how many, you know, hey, am I name gonna Baker Mayfield. <laughs> yeah. I mean, all, all of them, right? I mean, mm-hmm. they're all gonna do some of that to some extent. Joe Burrow from the first day he came to Cincinnati was like locked and loaded. Now, you know, he got hurt, yeah. whatever. But I think Justin Fields is going to be taken seriously from day one by his teammates up there. And you can live with that, those, some of those mistakes of a rookie in this season because he's going to make some spectacular plays. He's going to run. And Nagy, Nagy's a great guy as far as getting guys misdirection, going there, you know, all the Andy Reid stuff. They'll have he'll have it all working now because now he'll have a quarterback coming out the back end of this thing that can actually throw. They had one that could run. Now they can have one that can come out and throw the ball. I, I would, uh, if, if I had to say a team that I would be much higher on than what I'm seeing on this board, it would be. The do you, do you Bears. think, from your experience, do you think that that's because he and Burrow were older? Like Burrow was like a much older coming into the league than like you know uh, he's still Trevor Lawrence is. He's older than Lamar Jackson. Yeah, exactly. And like and Fields, you know, Fields is he came out early, but he spent he spent an extra year. I can't remember which grade. Like I think that there is something to this. Like you know, it, it's more professional for them. And I think that there was a, a professional anger out of him. He he. I think he came off extremely well in the draft process by being you know constantly dinged over and over and over again. And he just kind of had this calm about him. I think he'll fit in well in Chicago. The one worry I do have about him specifically in Chicago is the Nagy was the offensive coordinator when they sat Mahomes an entire year. And I, I worry if I'm betting the Bears, that he thinks that's the formula. When in reality, it was no. It's Kansas City and San Francisco, who we just talked about, are two circumstances that are conducive to a guy sitting. Like Chicago isn't. Chicago needs to get that, off the pot right now, play play fields, and try to win football games. If he feels that way, then he better hope his address and phone number are unlisted because <laughs> uh, the city of Chicago will be coming for him. Well, and the other part of this, if you're Ryan Pace, the GM, and Matt Nagy. Oh, yeah. You know, does this buy you a year? Does this oh, lose man. you a year? Does this get you fired if you don't play him? Or if you do play him and he's not good? It's terrible. You yeah. know, which, which which one is the worst of the two angles? Yeah, there? I mean, you got to hope that he shows something in, you know, in preparation where you go, okay, I'm excited to play this guy. I don't think Andy Dalton is that high of a bar there. What I think is really interesting is the, like, I was thinking about this with head coaches. So you have a quarterback the last year, the quarterback situation. Matt Nagy does not go into weekly prep for Nick Foles or Mitch Trubisky and get excited about, yeah. you know, diagnosing defenses and, and play calling. 
I feel like maybe for the first time since being coming a head coach, he'll have the excitement of my quarterback could execute some cool stuff. And I'm excited to see that because by all accounts, Matt Nagy was one of those guys in Kansas City that was a part of that, one of the most creative offenses. And so I'm with you. I, I believe that they'll play Justin Fields early, if not week one. And if Green Bay doesn't have Aaron Rodgers, Chicago and not Minnesota is the team that I think wins that. Chris, division. here's a betting related question. Last season, your first Sunday night game was Rams, uh, Cowboys. Cowboys, I think, closed favorite. Mm-hmm. Rams upset the Cowboys. It was a pretty uh, surprising result. This season on Sunday Night Football, week one, the Bears plus seven against the Rams. All the things you said about the Rams, all the things you said about the Bears. Chicago plus seven, a good bet? I would be on it. I mean, it just just because opening day, who knows anything, yeah. right? I mean, it's like it takes a month to figure out who these teams are anyway. Um, so, but I, I, I don't, I think the, I think the bears defense is better than what they did. Now they lose mm-hmm. some cornerbacks this year. That's yeah, uh, fuller, fuller. They lose uh screen. They lose, you know, so, uh, who knows what that means? Um, uh, but you know, we haven't even talked about, uh, the second round pick, but they, they move up again, get 13 Jenkins, spots yeah. and get Tevin Jenkins, you yeah. know, which, uh, and, both their tackles, if I'm not mistaken, both are in the final year of their contracts. Mm-hmm. So he could end up on the right side or left side as we move forward here uh, a year from now. Uh, but I, 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 you know, th- this has gone from a team that in my mind sort of felt like, what was the plan? Mm-hmm. You know, we were talking about Russell Wilson. We were talking about Deshaun Watson. But if you had your choice right now, would you rather have Russell Wilson in that contract or Justin Fields and the much cheaper contract, not even a top five pick, right? Yeah, yeah. Would you, what, who would you rather have moving forward for the next five years? I, I think if I'm naggy and pace, I probably still, I still take Fields in this situation. I, 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 it's weird because I think almost every other circumstance I'd say you take Russell Wilson on, but the Bears are a team – that are that is so depleted from having all the Khalil Mack first round picks gone, right? This is their first first round pick in forever. That if you bring if you bring in Wilson and further deplete the roster, like it might it might and then Wilson, you know, you could wonder if he's declining or not or whatever. To me, I think Fields does a great job because you have a a small contract. The bar is lower for quarterbacks on rookie deals, and you can come in and backfill now the rest of the roster. Well, and because plus, you're not you would have to give up all those draft picks exactly. for the next two or I mean, three years. I mean, that's the same condition the Rams are in, right? The Rams are not going to have a first round pick for like five years now. Like my kids are going to be in college by the time the Rams pick in the first round again, and so they, think about all the pressure that goes on Stafford there. And that pressure would be on Wilson, I think, 10 times as much. Yeah. Because I mean, you're not able to retain Allen Robinson that way. You're not able to retain, you know, there are going to be good pl- players that work out for you that you want to give second contracts to that you have to ignore because you have Wilson in this case. A- in addition to just say taking huge lottery tickets on the draft picks you have in rounds two and later. It, they would have looked very similar to how the Seahawks look, where it's just like yeah. we're trying to pay a lot of guys and we're not going to be able to pay that many. The quarterback's going to have to make up for that. And I'm, I'm with you. I, look, Justin Fields to me was a guy that was not in the conversation, should not have been in the conversation for any pick past three. So yes, I want a guy that could arguably be the number one pick at a cheap cost with that type of talent around him. Like that to me is the way that you get yourself into competition for a Super Bowl. They're 22 to one to make the Super Bowl out of the NFC. They're 50 to one to win it. Those are my long shot bets that I do like. I we cannot leave this program without talking about the Dallas Cowboys. That's true. So contractually obligated. Yeah, it, it, it's it's a law. Um, three three Cowboys games again this year. <laughs> Love it. Opening night against I Tampa mean, Bay. Beautiful. It's the greatest opening night game Sunday Night Football has ever had. Ever ever ever. So it's going to be. And uh, you and you guys got New England Tampa Bay. I mean, what a incredible. Yeah, Fred, you're gonna you're gonna be the only one that gets into that stadium for less than three grand. Mm-hmm. I might sell my seat. <laughs> yeah. I could probably get fifteen grand for my seat up there. I'll just stand over there somewhere in the corner and call the game. <laughs> um, so the Cowboys, here we go. So the big move, uh, of course, on the defensive side, Dan Quinn comes over. Mike Nolan is out. Um, 
and they the only negative i guess for them would be they were really thinking they're going to get a cornerback right almost under no circumstances hmm. were one of those two corners not going to end up falling to them uh it doesn't work out that way they trade out of the the pick um and then they but they do go on to draft eight of 11 players uh, on the defensive side. Their defense was simply terrible a year ago. Uh, maybe a little bit of a surprise is that Micah Parsons, the linebacker, where they've also spent a lot of resources yep. in, in the past, uh, becomes the pick. Now, I do understand in the Dan Quinn system, that cover three system, you have to have linebackers that can run, that can cover and help on those deep over routes and and some of that stuff is that all these teams are trying to go. If, if you, so uh, just to explain it a little bit, that the Seattle cover three system basically is going to have a man side and a zone side a lot of times. And so what they want to do is clear somebody out on the man side and run somebody across the field uh, into that open space because there's not really zone coverage on that that man side. So when you have linebackers that can run like they obviously do have. Uh, Jalen Smith, Micah Parsons, uh, Leighton Vander Esch, you know, those guys, uh, it, it certainly is going to help. But is this going to be enough to fix this defense um, that really was terrible last year? Yeah, and, and it's interesting, right? Because like the Jalen Smith, I mean, you're talking about if you cut him this year, I mean, pre-June 1, you have to pay back like almost $7 million. I mean, th this is not going to be – like when you look at Van Der Esch, they decline his fifth year option. They look, you look at uh, Jalen Smith. They also got, um, was it like they got a, a linebacker later on. So you're, you're sort of overloaded at a position. They also got Keanu Neal, a former Atlanta Falcon, to play weak side linebacker for them. Like they're loaded up at that position. And the question becomes, like, is that going to be enough to overcompensate for the fact that Trayvon Diggs struggled so much a season ago, that you let Byron Jones go, that your safety position is struggle, is struggles and, you know, meanwhile, in your front four, Demarcus Lawrence hasn't been the player you paid, right? Like, I wonder if they focused on the wrong place in this defense because, as you said, there is a, a cover three aspect to this, but the it's still the most important positions are defensive back and defensive line, and I don't know if they've gotten appreciably better there. Win total is nine and a half. Um, last year, I remember saying this. We were like, okay, was this the year for the Cowboys? I was like, I'm going to wait a year. Okay, I don't think it's going to be this year. I'm going to wait a year. And so technically, I should be very high on the Dallas Cowboys. And I think I, I can get myself there. I'm still nervous about the, the defense giving up like 35 points a game. And I, I, like, I don't... Me too. I, I look at rookies, and I think this is an important thing for people to remember. Rookies are drafted not to help you just this year. Okay, like if you have a rookie class and you're going, hey, man, this rookie class is going to fix everything this year. You're delusional. So to expect those rookies to come in and make a huge difference, especially, you know, at linebacker, I don't know that I, I can trust that. The one thing I'll say is this. Mike Nolan, and I remember Richard talking about this, you know, over the course of the season. Mike Nolan's scheme did not help those players out. They were confused left and right. And if Dan Quinn at least alleviates that problem and they know what they're supposed to do, then they can probably get into like the 20 to 25 range in terms of defenses. But I'll say this, man, I don't know that they're better than the Washington football team. I, I, I'll disagree there. I think, I, I think that the Washington football team has all of the characteristics of regression that we're, that, that we are not necessarily like buying into yet like the defense has added some players for sure um but they also lost ronald darby they also like defenses is, is it is a thing that sort of oscillates year to year and then on the other side of the ball they added weapons but we're on what year three or four of ryan fitzpatrick being a pretty good quarterback like are we ready have but in spurts tampa was six games at a time miami is six games at a time like, are we, re are we really buying into him and Taylor Heineke for 17 games, being able to play offense well enough where if you strip it all down, it's those two guys versus Dak? I'm not – that that's a bet I'm not willing – like, at the price, I mean, at plus 400 where it used to be, sure, but at plus 260, I, I, I'm You're not a You're very huge... high on Dak. You're very high on Dak, and he was great last year. He was great. Dak's was, been great the last two years. It's I think. a small sample of games. Uh, it's great. hard to assume – 
that you come back from that knee injury ready to go. I mean, you look at Roethlisberger a year ago off of that injury. Uh, Joe Burrow is going to have the same question coming up this year. Uh, Washington, the the one thing that – the one place if I were making wagers in Vegas that I would feel like I could take advantage a little bit is I think everybody bets offense. You know, people are betting the Dallas Cowboys because Dak's back yeah. and they've got the receivers and they've got Ezekiel Elliott, which you can argue that one all you want. Um, but I, I, when you look at – what Washington has up front on that defensive line. I mean, they are beasts across the front line. Yeah, I mean, they sure. really are. You you go Jonathan Allen, uh, Dron Payne, Montez Sweat, Chase lot, Young. A lot of first-round picks. All, all of them first-round yeah. picks, right, that are, are just loaded up there. Um, and, you know, Dallas's offensive line is still going to be, you know, what are they going to end up being? I, I, I think defense has a way of keeping you in games longer and maybe during a 17-game season as people fall off on the offensive side. Hmm. I, 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 would, I would look defense first and then come back to what I assume everybody knows about is on the offense. Well, that, that's where I'll, I'll go and say where the best bet is to win this division is actually very much what you're saying, but it's the Giants. At three, you know, plus three fifty. Patrick Graham's defense last year was very good. They were. They, they go ahead and they get uh, Blake. Mar Blake Martinez goes from being a bad player in Green Bay, being a pretty good one last year. Uh, Jabril Peppers is a good player. James Bradbury, now that he's not facing every NFC South wide receiver, Actually turns good. into Deion Sanders last season. And then you know Leonard Williams is a good player. That team is where I, you know bringing up George's point. If you get growth. From Andrew Thomas, who was pretty poor last year as the number four pick, Matt Parrott out of UConn, another tackle that they took, Will Hernandez. If you get if you get some growth out of the offensive line, you look at the weapons that they have. You're talking about Kadarius Tony, Kenny Galladay, uh, Evan Engram. Now Kelvin Benjamin, a former first round pick, playing tight end for them. You have obviously Barkley coming back. Uh, to me, Daniel Jones is the breakout candidate that. You know, they're going to find out if Daniel Jones is any good. If he stinks, it's going to be pretty apparent because there's going to be receivers open everywhere for that team. And that defense is not going to not going to put him in situations where he has to score 30 to win. You can go read our thoughts on the Giants on PFF.com on our win totals tracker. People have said we hated the Giants in years past. Not this year. Not this year. Every team well, has what a What is the over-under for them? The over-under for seven. the Giants. Seven. Wow, really? Yeah, yeah seven and ten. Seven, it's juiced to the over, over. minus 130. But I, I still think, I mean, I would still take it because, because it's a, it's a, it's not a great division. The Eagles, I think, are going to lay down this year. It's going to be two wins right there. Then you can split with the other teams. And then you're, you're facing the third place schedule, like, you know, or no, yeah. second place schedule. They finished second. I also, here's a conjecture I have, Chris, and I'm curious what you think about this. To me, the Cowboys always have to win like, 1.2 games to win a game and the reason for that is that there's more media coverage and more scrutiny on the cowboys than any other team by a mile they win a game get up spends the first hour talking about the cowboys they lose a game they spend the first hour and a half talking about the cowboys with Stephen a smith with yeah <laughs> like it's just it's unbelievable they over analyze the dallas cowboys to the nth degree jerry jones is so i mean he's such a presence the media is such a presence and there's a lot of pressure. And so that swing of emotion to me makes it harder for the Cowboys to be good. I, 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 I guess, or it forces you to be good every week. Whereas like in Cincinnati, if we went on a little winning streak, <laughs> you could go. There, there wasn't a million people still to tell you why you stunk. Yeah. All, the, all the articles were nice about that. I, I am interested in the Giants because I do think they've got get open guys you know that if, if barkley can come back if if uh ingram is a one-on-one -on -one, i can get open guy mm -hmm. galladay is going to be able to contest and catch down the field a little bit if daniel jones Kadarius tony is nobody is covering him one-on-one -on -one, i promise you that wouldn't surprise me if they brought him out of the backfield and all he ever did was half back options all year that that was his only play yeah. um and and sterling shepherd but this is a team if if daniel jones can get protected you know enough he's going to have enough guys open quickly the comparisons were always to the manning family yeah. coming out of, of duke right this is the time 
Don't hold the ball. Get it out of your hands. Somebody's going to be open quickly, and it could be a formula for success. I would see. I, now I understand why everybody goes over. Like you can always yeah, yeah, make yeah. the case <laughs> yeah. for why a team's going to go, do good, and what you can't anticipate is this guy got hurt and that guy got hurt, and you you don't know. Well, I think that the way to curb that is to take long shots on teams that you that are weaker, right? So the the way to what you don't want to do is lay minus 300 for the Chiefs to win the AFC West, right? Because if you are wrong, you're going to lose your shirt. If if you if you like the Giants, I feel like just betting them to win, if you you only have to win that bet like a little over 20% of the time, that's the way I think to buy into a lot of these sort of teams where it's a long shot, right? If you go Bears to win the North, Giants to win the East, yep. Seahawks to win the West, like if you win one of those, you break even. And if you win two of them, you're having, you're going back to Vegas. All right, you guys promo your own show for a minute here. Tell us what's coming up this week. What do we uh, what do we have going on? We have a good show this week. We have um, we're starting our divisional betting previews. We're going to go through every division. We're starting with the NFC North, and we have Aaron Nagler on. So Aaron Nagler covers the Packers. We have at one point feuded with Aaron Nagler. He has cursed us out on his program. <laughs> He's then come on the program and cursed us out on our program. It's always a great time. And I'm going to make him defend the Packers in this Aaron Rodgers yeah. uh, debacle. Our show is called the PFF Forecast. It is every single Sunday night and every single Wednesday night on this on YouTube, iTunes. All you guys stuff. do the work of it's impossible. Like after all the games, <laughs> and you guys are just burning hot with with opinions, and you're mad, and you've won a few bets, you've lost a few bets, you're finger pointing. It's one of the more entertaining shows, but it is truly like the first podcast mm -hmm. that you could listen to after Sunday Night Football. We come straight down here, bleary-eyed. Uh, if I forget the cold brew coffee, it can be a real tough sell. But it's always fun, though, when like a team, so like last season, George stuck his neck out on Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh got blown out by Buffalo and then they got and then like just a few weeks later they got blown out by Cleveland in the playoffs. Yeah. Those are fun because obviously when you take stands on on things people call you an idiot. People oh. say things about oh. you as you know oh. probably way better than we do. But I always say what's great about betting is you can like you can take a stand yourself, right? You don't you're like if somebody if somebody doesn't like the Giants, you can short the Giants. If somebody doesn't like the Bears, you you don't have to tell me about it. You can go and that, wager your own money on it. I mean, yeah. you had Ben Roethlisberger fired up. <laughs> I had to go do a, the playoff game, some of those games late in the year. He was coming after me, and I said, "Wait a minute, this is not me." But you called it. You were like, uh, "Did you actually call?" Like they were eleven and zero. Yep, they won. Right. They eleven and zero, so and you week, called the collapse of the Pittsburgh Steelers. The week that I they won one more game, but it was the Wednesday game against Baltimore. And remember who they played at quarterback? They that was your R game, the, oh, right? Like, I'm never going to forget. They had that. RG three <laughs> and Trace McStory. They almost lost yeah. that game, and when they play that game, I go, I think we're well. Then they they did win. They did so. They were ten and zero when you said it. Then they won that game. Then they got blown out a few times, and then they were getting blown out by Indianapolis. And That's then Indy, right. they, they, they came back and won because Ben threw the ball over 10 yards downfield for once. And that saved them. I believe they probably they would not have won. The remember they lost the Bengals over here on Monday oh, night? It was a trophy. I very well remember yeah, that they, they collapsed big time. And then the funniest part about it was the Week 17 game. They're starting Mason Rudolph, and they give the Browns a game. Browns need to win to get in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. Then they start all their starters the following week and get blown out. But, it was a very weird year for them. So do you think Pittsburgh comes back with that same quick throw offense this year? Or do they – now you've got Ben with another year recovered with the arm. They've got down-the-field threats that they can play with. They're not going to be able to run yeah. the ball no matter who they drafted. I don't care, Najee and all that stuff. Um, they're going to have to rebuild that offensive line. Is this going to go back to the old days of Ben holding it, throwing it, stiff arming, getting it down the field instead of this, you know, throw in less than two seconds? Thing? They they might. I think that with Matt Canada, they're probably going to do the the jet sweep stuff. They're trying. I think they're going to. I don't think that they can beat a team forward backward. I uh, north south. They have to beat a team east west with some of those, you know, the Washingtons and those yeah. guys. And I don't know if they're going to be able to because you look at that division and Baltimore's fast, Cleveland's fast, and the Bengals aren't very good defensively, but at least they have athletes. 
And and I, to me, I think that the 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 league is sort of passed by the Steelers as far as being able to be an efficient offense at this point. My whole premise for saying that they were overrated was that from a clean pocket on first and second down, their passing game was not efficient. And it carried through. I mean, Ben Roethlisberger had the 31st best grade from a clean pocket last year. And I don't know that they have the weapons to really make up for that. You know, I, I think they have good weapons. I don't think they're great. Um, this is a sneaky team where I, I could see the wheels coming. If they want to draft the running back top five next year, they might be able to. The, here, here's a promo for PFF. Big Ben has not graded well since 2017. He led the NFL in passing yards in 2018. Yep. This was foreseeable for a while. The, the hard part is, is you have to divorce the results, right? Being 10-0, and 0, right, with a lot of close wins and a lot of games against teams that weren't ready to win, like, Defense like the Bengals yep. and, the, and the Browns. And then, you know, eventually those things topple over. Eventually, you know, the, the, league, the league can stay weird longer than we can stay solvent, but just barely. <laughs> There we go. Well, this was fun. We're going to do this again. I, 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 um, I, I'm always worried whenever I say something that Vegas would go, that's not true, right? You know, mm -hmm. if you believe in a team or against yeah. a team, or in a, more often than not, Vegas knows. And, I, and I'm actually starting to pay attention a little bit more now, not so much because I'm betting myself, not that I'm opposed to it, but, but that – uh, you know those guys they don't miss much they don't take many big swings and miss because well, they're they're the it's the it's like the stock market right yeah. everyone's opinion shows up on a board in vegas and it's a beautiful way to look at how people that are really willing to put their money where their mouth is feel about teams you got smart people that put lots of money on there you have tons of dumb people but are willing to put their money out there and you get a great consensus I think it's well, the, awesome. In the Wisdom of the Crowds book by James Sorwicki, I believe, they said, I don't care if your opinion's dumb as long as it's independent. And that, to me, in every walk of life, we're starting to get people grouping into groups where the, the wisdom of the crowds goes away because not enough independent opinions are heard. In the betting markets, it's a lot of independent opinions. And eventually, by the time you get to a Sunday game, everybody's – yeah, you know, that that number is pretty pounded into place, and so if you have a different opinion so on listen, a Sunday morning, listen to the forecast at uh, two a.m., which is why <laughs> you do the, the best chance that you have to win a bet the following Sunday is to listen to you guys. Right, there you go, right after the game on Sunday night because you're already looking ahead to the next Sunday. I have no better That's way. As to good say. a commercial as I can do. <laughs> thank you guys. That was fun. Thanks, Chris. All right, thank you so much for tuning in today. Next week, we're going to be joined by one of the most important men in all of football, a general manager for a team that may have made the biggest move of the entire offseason. We will let you mull that over for a bit. Make sure you subscribe to the feed to get the episode as soon as it drops next week, and we will see you then.